He was born two months early. And this year he turns 21. You'd never know it now, but at his birth, my 20-year-old son, Jonathan, weighed just two and a half pounds. I could easily hold him in one hand. We were lucky, though. Jonathan was born without many of the problems premature babies can have. From the beginning, he was breathing pretty much on his own, although we had to leave him in that warm Lucite box hooked up to all those wires and tubes. We could take him out bundled up to hold him. But Jonathan was born with a special circumstance, or problem, or some people might call it a handicap. Jonathan was born without a left hand. I'm not one of those people who routinely remember my dreams in any vivid way, but in the days and for a couple of weeks after Jonathan's birth, I had a recurring dream. In it, there appeared as a kind of central figure a little blonde-haired boy in an Easter suit. Perfect, complete with two hands. I was startled by how it repeated so clearly every night, and I began to welcome the dream oddly. It became a kind of companion to me as we began to deal with the reality of his birth, all the questions about what this life of his might be like, what would he be able to do or not do, what about the other kids, the inevitable questions, the stares, and on and on. I was scheduled to preach about a month after Jonathan was born, and in that sermon I decided to tell the story of his birth and the dream I'd been having and the utterly brilliant sense I had begun to make of it. You see, I had figured out that the little blonde-haired boy in the dream was the perfect fantasy version of my son that I'd been gestating in my head for seven months. And God was surely telling me in the dream that I had to let go of that perfect fantasy child in order to receive the gift of the real, imperfect little boy who had been born. Pretty good, I thought. Didn't I need to learn to love my son just as he was and is, not as I would have planned him to be? Doesn't Jesus tell us that we have to accept the cross of reality if we are to follow his way of love? Didn't Christ empty himself, taking on our imperfect nature in order to redeem it? Well, yes, he did. As a Christian, I believe all those things, but my spiritual pride let me off the hook way too easily and way too early. During this time of my life, I was exchanging sermons regularly with a friend here in Chicago, a priest, someone who had been a good friend of mine for a long time, and one of those blessed people who knows me better than I do. And he wrote his own sermon in response to the one I had written. In it, he told his congregation about Jonathan's birth, about the way my wife and I were dealing with it and about my dream. And then he said words which have become the story of my adult faith journey. He told his congregation about my interpretation of the little boy in the Easter suit, about my conclusion that it represented that perfect little fantasy child I had to let go of. But then he said this, Jeffrey's wrong. It's not a perfect fantasy Jonathan in the dream. It's a perfect fantasy Jeffrey. He was right. Jonathan's birth laid bare the wounds at the heart of my life. My son was and is just fine. It was me God wanted to heal. I have spent most of my life believing that if I was only smart enough, good enough, elegant enough, capable enough, hardworking enough, 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 if only I could be glittering enough, I might be saved. I might be safe. All my own little personal versions, of course, of that ancient curse of our kind, the belief that we can do it ourselves, heal ourselves, save ourselves. It's a view of God held in some form by many, many people, I think, a view a former assistant of mine liked to call the cosmic job interview. God is the almighty CEO sitting behind the biggest desk in the universe, and only when I've got my resume honed and my shoes shined and my best interview techniques ready to go can I risk knocking on the door? The Bible tells a story about Jesus and Peter. Jesus has just told his friends that he's going to be crucified, not the version of a successful, conventionally powerful savior they'd been hoping for. That's never going to happen to you, says Peter. And Jesus calls Peter Satan and tells him, get out of the way. I think, though, the lie that we can save ourselves masks a deeper suspicion that God really is that demanding, angry, judging figure behind the smoke and mirrors of Oz. And I don't know what else the cross is but the unmasking of that. 
That's why the cross of Jesus is such a potent symbol and why some of us cling to it for dear life. In the Jewish mystical tradition, there is the suggestion that in order to create something that was not the omnipresent God, God present everywhere, God had to create a space within God's own being in order to create an other that was not God. God, in other words, is wounded in the act of creation. It's a birthing image. And that idea is brought to its Christian conclusion in the crucified one. The book of Revelation's vision of the Lamb of God, God's word, holy wisdom, slain from all eternity. The cross, in other words, isn't some kind of transaction appeasing a bloodthirsty God. It is the ultimate revelation of the shape of God's own heart. It is simply God being God, entering our wounded, imperfect, bleeding humanity so that we might be remade, so that we might have some good news for a world that knows all about imperfection and fear and death. The resurrected Jesus does not lose his wounds. He takes them with him into the fullness of what we call resurrection. In one story, the Bible tells us that his wounds were the only way at least one of his friends was able to recognize him at all, and it's still the most reliable way. There's a wonderful Victorian hymn. Some of the lyrics go like this. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice, which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior. There is healing in his blood. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given. There is plentiful redemption in the blood that has been shed. There is joy for all the members in the sorrows of the head. For the love of God is broader than the measure of the mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more faithful, we should take him at his word, and our life would be thanksgiving for the goodness of the Lord. Unaccountably, in the version of that hymn that's sung in most places, a verse has been omitted, but it's my favorite. It goes like this, but we make his love too narrow by false limits of our own, and we magnify his strictness with a zeal he will not own. The monk Thomas Merton said the only definition of God that made any sense to him at all was mercy within mercy within mercy within mercy. The really shocking claim of the Christian tradition is that this endless fountain of mercy, the creator of the universe, the ultimate holy mystery we call God, became merely fully human. A favorite theologian of mine says, we crucified Jesus not because he was God, but because he claimed to be God and then failed to come up to our standards for assessing the claim. We didn't want to be saved in our humanity. We wanted to be fished out of it. We still do. I don't know how else to explain the monstrous fantasies of those novels and movies about being left behind. This misreading of scripture, from my perspective, that predicts all those who believe precisely the right things about Jesus will be scooped up out of the great tribulation, as it's called, and everybody else will be left to suffer the wrath of God. That kind of bloodthirsty killer God is not the one who insists on coming to us on our own terms, not the one I see revealed in Jesus. Fishing us out of our humanity is the one thing God refuses to do. That's the lesson I have been learning for the last 20 years. It's the lesson I should have been learning my whole life. It's not the fantasy version, version of myself, the carefully edited, hyper-competent, polished caricature of me I put out there for public consumption. It's not that me that Jesus loves and died for. It's the real me, just as I am without one plea. Imperfections, wounds, heartaches, disappointments, fears, joys, sins, unrealized plans, and all. And healing, transformation, means letting down my guard long enough to let the wounded and glorified God revealed in Jesus embrace the real me, hold the real me, and fill the real me with his own life. So, where are your wounds? It's an important question. 
What are the secret, shameful, inadequate, fearful, wounded, missing parts of yourself that you would rather keep safely out of reach and view? Could it be that those are the very things God loves most? Could they be the gifts out of which God can make you and me agents of compassion, hope, and healing in this world?